had asked me to uh, give you a quick run through of, of the background for this, most of them will talk about the uh, intervention study that we've been doing in El Salvador. Um, but it is a global problem. This is a report that was in Lancet in 2013. And I don't expect you to read the countries, there are 30 countries here, but it distributes the known the causes as attributed. And the far right here, um, uh -oh. over here is the, uh, it doesn't work. It shows up. It does, but you can see it, I can see it. Okay. These, all these salmon colored ones are the variations of unknown etiology. Um, and it is quite dramatic. You have some that, like this one, which is Nigeria, which is at least half of it. But that also can be an incomplete diagnosis. So it's, it's just an area of unknowns. But as, as Rick was pointing out, uh, across the middle of the um, globe uh, is where the um, in increased incidence has been discovered. Um, L uh, the uh, Central American uh, mesonephropathy here, mesoamerican nephropathy is, is the red circle on the left. And then um, you can see Sri Lanka, you can say Udinam. Um, some of them are toxic uh, epidemics like uh, aristolochic acid and, and, um, and uh, cadmium, the itayatayat disease in Japan. But the, the black uh, circles are those which refer to um, increased incidence of without known uh, explanation. So it, it's really a, um, it's in the tropical zones that uh, this excess is occurring. It's also occurring in Brazil, not on the slide. Um, but Mesoamerican nephropathy is, <coughs> is occurring in Central America. And uh, what's notable about it is, it is it's occurring from southern Mexico down to Panama on the Pacific coast of Mesoamerica, primarily in agricultural communities, which are also poor communities. Those are probably correlated, uh, and poverty is important to this. But the striking thing is age is mostly occurring in 30 to 50-year-olds, male to female ratio, 3 to 1. And uh, the example here in Nicaragua and El Salvador, men um, in different communities range between 7 and 42 percent, and women 7 to 40 to 10 percent. So that it's really uh, suggested, suggesting a, an occupational ideology in that in that differential. And sugarcane uh, cutters are not exclusively, but they're without a doubt the most commonly affected population. <clears throat> so we tried to introduce an intervention to address the, these issues. And this is my report on uh, where we are in that study, which is in the final stages now. The basis for the study was sugarcane workers were the most affected. Uh, the problem has been in hot and hot humid climates. This is a very physically demanding job. Um, one uh, of our team, who is a sports medicine physiologist, uh, said it's kind of like running a marathon uh, every day for six months. Um, and she was not joking. This is, this is really serious physical labor. Um, with little or no protection against the heat. So the leading hypothesis that we're operating with has to do with heat stress and dehydration due to strenuous work on a continuous basis. That, that said, um, it's, it's not clear that this is a the cause. It appears to be certainly a contributing factor. And how central it is or not um, is unknown. Other hypotheses have included uh, pesticides, herbicides, other chemicals. Not good evidence on this, even though glyphosate was removed in Sri Lanka um, as attributed to their, their epidemic. Heavy metals, inorganic arsenic, cadmium, known to have this effect, but it's not clear that that's the reason in this setting. Hard water, leptospirosis, uh, use of uh, NSAIDs, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are commonly used in this area. These people are suffering a lot of musculoskeletal pain, and so they are taking it, and it's very available to them. So that's a background to this. I'm hoping uh, Gabby's presentation later this afternoon will um, enlighten us on some of the, the broader aspects of this. But sugarcane in Central America, this is, um, they burn the cane before they cut it. Um, that generally, they do it the night before, sometimes just in advance, as you can see in this worker on the right. Um, these are huge fields and very physically demanding because they have to cut this and then move the cane as they cut it. Um, uh, so, 
with that simple background, uh, the methods of our study. What we wanted to try to do, and, and this is a pilot study that I'm presenting on today, we have just finished in our, doing the analysis on an expanded uh, study based on the findings from this pilot. Uh, we, we wanted to introduce the three factors that were necessary to address the um, dehydration stressful work hypothesis which was provide the workers with water throughout the day, give them rest and shade, and improve their efficiency. Improving the efficiency was necessary because if we gave them rest and shade, we were going to extend their work days. And we didn't want, and they're piece weight workers. So we didn't want to be in a position of asking them to reduce their income in order to be healthier because it, it just wasn't going to fly. Um, the other thing that, that I want to emphasize in this is our intervention was on the impact of heat stress. We hoped it would have an impact on the kidney. But that link is not clear enough yet that we could say that if we don't see uh, a positive impact on the kidney, then we are, um, our intervention is failing. There's no question this workforce needs this type of intervention for heat stress alone. Um, the tents were made in such a way that they could be moved with the cutting so that they stayed with the workers. They didn't have to go back to some base to, do the, uh, to get their shade. Uh, the water was provided in camelbacks, uh, which was uh, camelback. The manufacturers provided them to us at a quarter of the cost. And um, they, they were uh, well re received in the first year. And the efficiency was changing the type of machete that was being used, as well as the, the uh, design of the, of the work organization for cutting rows. We reduced the number of cutting rows in order to reduce the amount of carrying they had to do. The, the machete made much more efficient cutting. First time we used it, nobody wanted to use it, and then we got one young guy to try using it, and he wouldn't give it back to us. Um, so it clearly uh, ma made a difference for them in cutting. The study was done, um, we started with 56 and 60 people inland and coastal, and we were comparing the two areas because the inland area was uh, in, in a higher, land, uh, higher altitude, 450 meters, and that was an area which had been less affected in some of the studies, or indicators where it was less affected, and the coastland. Um, and we were going to do both of them. We we're going to stagger the introduction of the, of the intervention to look at pre-post. Um, uh, for a variety of reasons, it didn't work out that way, but the, um, in the end, we had 41 people in both groups that had uh, been studied in, in, in the four main study periods. Baseline, which was November, uh, pre-intervention, which was January, um, the uh, midterm, which was uh, uh, early March, and the final was in April, just as they were finishing. Uh, the Coastland, for security reasons, they, we dropped them out. Uh, we had to have armed guards with us to do the study every time we were in the field. Armed military, four um, people each time watching over us. We dropped uh, the uh, participation. There were a few people that put, took place in the took part in the coastland in the uh, pre-intervention, just thirteen. And then we didn't do any of the intermediate uh, studies. And then at the end, we convinced them to come back to a central point to be studied, which was helpful, as you'll see. Uh, there was every two weeks, we uh, collected urine and also did a symptom survey, which I don't have the full results of. I got some limited results of. WBGT was measured daily in both groups, recorded continuously. Water refills were uh, once the intervention began in January. Um, we asked the workers to daily report how many times they'd refilled the, um, the camelback. Not a very precise measure, but at least something. And then there was a weekly assessment of the difficulty of the work, because depending on the cane, the work could be more or less physically demanding in a physically demanding setting. So in terms of productivity, the dark line is the, our group. The other, gr the other ones are major groups in the same in Henio. Um, the thing to note about this, April really uh, can be tossed off because they, that was when they were doing mostly cleanup. It was irregular production. But this is, this is production, average production in tons per person per day uh, for each of the groups. 
And um, all the groups started going down as the, it got hotter when we started our intervention, except um, the uh, Caporal One, uh, who, who proceeded to um, work at a pace that we don't quite understand. We're studying him this year. Um, but even so, our group uh, increased uh, its productivity more rapidly than any other group and was the second highest of, in final. So I think we managed that part of it reasonably well. Um, details of how we did that and the expertise that went into that we can talk about. This is, I think, the more striking thing. This is the WBGT, daily WBGT. Bottom left, 6 to 7 a.m. Uh, bottom right is 5 to 6 p.m. The coastland group is red, the inland group is blue, and the coastland group quit earlier. It was too hot for them to work really much past noon. And this is a distribution uh, each hour of the full day of, um, of each day throughout the whole harvest being plotted continuously. I mean, um, categorically across this, this uh, graph. And you can see that the 26, 28, and 30 are the uh, OSHA guidelines, generalized ISO guidelines in terms of levels. Above 26, you should be resting 25% and working 75% of the time. Above 28, it's 50-50. Above 30, it's 25% work, 75% uh, rest. And you can see there are substantial periods of the day when they should be resting most of the time. Um, they weren't, but they should have been resting most of the time. Our intervention with the water rest shade gave them about, um, on average, a 25% rest, 75% work day all the time. In the, in the inland group, the coastland group, uh, did not get the intervention. Um, and so how bad was it? Well, if you look on the right here, greater than 30% of the, greater than 30 degrees centigrade WBGT, in the coastline, 38% of their hours were in excess of that threshold. And inland, it was 14% of the hours. The coastline, 21% greater than 28. So the coastline was working about 60% of the time in a way that they should have been resting 50% of the period of time that they were working. This, these are extreme um, hot environments to try to be working in. We did uh, an evaluation of heat stress and dehydration symptoms, ones that we selected um, as hopefully targeting uh, this, this um, category of problems. And uh, the, the red is uh, the uh, pre-intervention and the blue is post-intervention. We haven't looked at all 11 um, times that we've measured the uh, symptoms, but just to give you an idea. And it, generally speaking, they all um, fell over the course of the, um, uh, after the intervention. Dysuria, if anything, increased. We have a lot of difficulty understanding what is meant by dysuria in this context. So um, it, it's not clear that that's a, a, a measure of anything that fits into the paradigm that we were trying to study. Vomiting is up a bit, Vomiting is up a bit too. It's, it's small and we're not, we're not sure. That, th those two words were difficult r really to translate effectively for the purposes we had, which is not to say they aren't real. It's just I'm not sure what they're saying. So for our conclusions, the short-term success, not definitive or large, but heat stress impacts appear to be reduced. Kidney function parameters appear to be less affected. And we need longer-term follow-up um, on this. Uh, and obviously, research is still needed on the possible cofactors. I wanted to show you one other thing, which is this is this year's um, uh, uh, Coastland WBGT graph. And if you uh, look at that, it's clearly much higher. Uh, and I, the, the color choice is poor, but that gives you an idea of how uh, different and how much higher it was this year. It's an unusual, it was known to be an unusual year. The, there was a terrible harvest. It was El Nino. Um, but uh, the, the overall temperature was higher. Interestingly, anecdotally, the, the workers reported it as, as not as bad. So who knows what uh, people think. Um, and this last thing I just wanted to show you from the uh, hot haps um, uh, equation we looked at El Salvador. Uh, the left-hand point is 1990, and those are um, five different models that have been used to um, project WBGT increase over the course of the next um, 
roughly a century. And you can see you're really getting into baseline where, um, where nobody could work. Uh, anyway, that's, that's what I have to say. I beat the one minute. Oh, no, wait, I have one more minute. One more minute. This is, for those of you who might be interested, the, uh, there was a workshop on Mesoamerican nephropathy in Costa Rica in November. The proceedings have just been issued. They're available in PDF format at that website if you, wanna, if you want them. Issues with getting into these farms and working with these workers, or how do you how do you do that? How do, how do you get in in the first place? Yeah, right. We had uh, the luck to ha happen upon. I think that's a fair thing, Jason, to say that uh, to a um, in Henio where the uh, owner uh, was raised in the Jesuit tradition and believed in uh, social justice and was willing to let us in and to contribute money. That is, he paid for those tents, he paid for the water delivery, uh, he paid for staff that was necessary to, to maintain some of this. Yeah, I'd like to add, you know, there was a report in 2000 that was done in Nicaragua between Papa Leon and Ingenio San Antonio. So the two big players in Nicaragua. And the conclusions of that report, this is a live report, it's an internal report, were the concern was heat stress, exposure to gun phosphates and other pesticides, perhaps fertilizers and three, consumption of NSAIDs, in their own words, because the labor is not humane. The posture they're forced to maintain and the length of time. Those are the three things he listed in the internal report. That company, and then that was leaked to us in the, in the Center for Public Integrity, that report, by an engineer in Saigon. And then about, for the next six, seven years, the company blamed it on volcanoes, alcoholism, and whatever you can find. Uh, very, you know, typically we've all, everybody in this room has seen that game. It, it, we're we're getting close climate change. Around 2009, this story got it started getting picked up and kicked around, and then a lot of the industry started introducing their own interventions. To their credit, to some, some degree, started introducing water, started introducing uh, electrolyte solutions, and some had started that even earlier. But none of them had assessed it, and none of them had peer reviewed or published it, and none of them had brought in independent verification of them implementation. And so ultimately, it looks more like risk mitigation internally than, than trying to move forward. And I think the difference here with a long hell, and I think increasingly in the industry, is there does seem to be this kind of recognition of like, okay, we don't have all the answers on ideology. It might not just be this. But if anyone's going to take this seriously, we need to get the data out there and assess them. So it's a big shift, and it started with this, but it's not unique to this. You know, like Lee's group is doing some really important work in uh, There was a question to Max earlier about the role of OSHA in this when he was discussing NIOSH and OSHA. No, OSHA doesn't really have any uh, regulations relating to heat stress, and that's, that's one of the problems we deal with internationally, that th this is all, um, this problem should be solved for heat stress alone, whether the kidneys were ever involved or not, and it's, and it's not being. Can I add one yeah. quick question? It's a very simple solution to a complex problem. <laughs> but uh, the thing is, how, did, how should we assess the dehydration to first instance? Heat stress. When we are going to the field, you assess a problem, that the problem existed, the heat stress the patient is having. Then you intervene with how much amount of water is required to get into some sort of intervention post effect, pre effect and post effect, and uh, what sort of how much amount of water is required to mitigate those uh, dehydration. Objective, subjective parameters you are taking. Yeah. But objective can be assessed by any urine osmolality or specific gravity to pre, then you intervene by giving water, then after that you assess the specific gravity. Terribly tough question, and, and um, we haven't figured out yet what, how, to, how to parse that out effectively. I will say that um, the, the folks we've been working with are, um, and, and I think the the folks at Usarium agree too that um, that if people have access to water, they won't get dehydrated. Um, they, the, the, the thirst drive will get them to rehydrate sufficiently. The question is, what's the access and how 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 easy is it, and is it clean water? Which is a different question. That's separate from the question you were talking about: is how do you how do you actually assess this 
and we're still struggling with that. So I was at a symposium in, in by the Danone in France where this was the big question, and they had a lot of experts talk about it. And uh, if you can me have measurements, urine osmolarity, urine osmolarity is probably the most sensitive. But a guy named Lawrence Armstrong, not to be confused with the bicyclist, <laughs> uh, was, uh, had a very nice presentation where he could use, they, they were able to show that just by looking at the color of the urine, you could tell a little bit about the level of hydration. And he's actually done clinical trials, taking his uh, color code chart to, you know. So uh, there, are, there are these simpler m methods that have been proposed. But I think that the question is really a threshold question. I mean, we can figure out that it is affected. We can show you data that's affected. The question is, how would you know you're doing good enough in the field at the time, rather than in an analysis that occurs six months later? What's the uh, kind of median oxidant age? I mean, you mentioned the age of 30 to 50, but how long typically have these people been working in the fields? Because this could also go back to some of the objective data maybe something that's over many years of work that we start to see this in, you know, one year of data, although, you know, it might be encouraging, you know, if you spend out three or four years, that's when you might see a real separation. So yeah. has anyone yeah. looked at, like, the ons, uh, how long these people typically work uh, compared to level of disease? This is, this population's um, average duration of harvests, when you mean work, because they've worked since they you know, could go, go to work, um, is, is somewhere between seven and nine years. It's not a long time. <clears throat> this population, the people that get the disease who aren't working, have worked longer. But um, it, there's not very good data on this. There's a study going on in Nicaragua now, a community-based study that's longitudinal over two years. Is it two or three? Uh, three. It'll be three. three. Um, which which uh, will hopefully give us a better understanding of this. We have uh, one year uh, follow-up on this population and a little bit of evidence on two years. Hi, uh, thank you. Great presentation. And this is my question. They're going to show my ignorance. Um, the uh, length of the season for sugarcane harvest, has that uh, changed over the years? And the second one is, our, did you see signs of overt heat and um, uh, high exertion types of diseases such as heat stroke or rhabdomyolysis or things like that? There is heat stroke. Um, we have seen, uh, and during our intervention, it, there were fewer cases, but we're talking, the numbers are small enough that you really can't count them very reliably. It appeared there was less in, in the one year study we did. In terms of season, it varies depending upon the anticipated uh, temperature and uh, um, precipitation that occurs. Uh, it, can, it can start um, early to mid-November. It started last year, early December, and it can last until um, March or April. 